Good morning, River Church. I'm glad that you're joining us online. Uh, I know it stinks a little bit we can't all get together, but uh, through the power of technology, we're able to reach out. Um, ask you to bow your heads with me real quick, and we'll open this thing up with prayer, and um, we'll go play you a super powerful message from earlier in the year. And uh, stay tuned afterwards. We've got a few announcements to give to you. Uh, so let's bow our heads. Father God, Lord, we thank you for an opportunity, Lord, just to walk this earth once once again and, and be able to be your servants. Lord, I pray that the folks that are able to listen to this via online today, Lord, that they're able to receive this word with an open mind and an open heart. And I pray that it'll get into them and stir them up, Lord, and it'll just change something in their lives. And Lord, I pray that uh, as this weather is falling today, Lord, as you keep us all safe and uh, just enjoy each other's company and the comforts of our homes. And we pray that you'll do all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we'll stay put. We'll get today's message on. Uh, it's going to be the Rose of Sharon that uh, Pastor David did back in February. And uh, then I'll come back on afterwards and give you a few announcements. you got your Bible, turn to the Song of Solomon. The Song of Solomon. Chapter 2. Song of Solomon's that book that the pages are still stuck together in it that you haven't read much because you didn't understand it. You didn't know what it was about. Yet the Song of Solomon is arguably one of the most beautiful passages of scripture in, in the whole Bible and what it speaks to us. The Song of Solomon, chapter 2. I want to use the first two verses this morning. Simply says this I am the rose, or I am a rose, depending on the translation you have. Actually, A is better than D. I am a rose of Sharon, the lily of the valleys. Like a lily among the thorns, so is my darling among the maidens. Now, let, let's look at that again because you have to understand that the Song of Solomon is actually a, a, a poem written by two lovers, one to another. There's the bridegroom and there's the bride. And going through the Song of Solomon, you have to pay really close attention to understand who's writing about who at the moment. Verse 1 is the bride. She says, I am a rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley. Then the groom says, like a lily among the thorns, so is my darling among the maidens. Now, the Song of Solomon, again, it is, it is prolific in its language about love. As a matter of fact, it is so explicit in the way in which it is written that the Jewish scribes and rabbis of the day would not let unmarried people read it until they were about to get married. And looking at it through that context and that context alone, there's a huge amount of truth concerning human love and, and human relationship and the relationship between a husband and and a wife. That's there, and all that can be taken literally as we read it and understand that that's the kind of deep passion you and I are to have for our spouses. But the Song of Solomon wasn't just put there as a love poem for you and I to read and to think about one another. At its highest purpose, the Song of Solomon is actually a picture of the love relationship that is between, or should be between, Christ and His church. Between the, the, the bridegroom, the Lord Jesus, who is soon to come, and his bride, who is you and I. Now, in the conversation, the bride compares herself. I'm skewed up here a little bit. The bride compares herself to a rose of Sharon and to a lily of the valley. Now, at first, it looks like she is boasting of her beauty. But the reality is this, 
she actually is not. If you read the first chapter of Song of Solomon there, you will find out that she comes to the groom and she's, she's basically saying, who am I that you would choose me? Why? Because my skin is sunburnt. It's baked. I have been not one who has been allowed to be in the house and take on the normal chores of a, of a woman of that day, but my family has forced me to go into the vineyards and into the fields and to work like one of my brothers. My skin is burnt. I can imagine that uh, growing up on a farm really helps me when I'm reading passages like this because I really understand what this means. Her hands are probably calloused. Her arms are probably a little bit more buff than, than most of the girls. And she is working alongside the guys out in the field. This, this is a picture here of you and I in circumstances that are less than good. Maybe you find yourself this morning in a situation that uh, you, you, you can't hardly accept the fact that God loves you. Or you're in a situation that you think, God would never choose me to do that. God would never have me do that. I could never serve the Lord like that because of where I come from. Am I talking to anybody yet this morning? My background is such that there is nothing in me that the Lord should really want to look at me and say, I want you. Also, the plains of Sharon are, were a low place in the promised land. So she is saying, I come from a low place. I don't come from a place of prestige, but I come from a low place and I'm just another. Here's literally what she's saying here. She's saying, I'm just, another, I'm just another one of the roses in the midst of the briar bushes in the low places of Sharon. My assignment this morning is to show you that you cannot have the rose unless you're willing to go through the thorns. Because you see, if you were to, and I don't, don't do it because it just, it'd just be such a mess in here, we'd have to pay a cleaning fee this morning to have them. I'll do it, and I'm still making a mess up here. But if you were to unwrap that rose that you had this morning, you would see that that stem is filled with thorns. And these have already been handled so much that the thorns have have been mashed a little bit and have a feeling maybe JT, Jessica did a little bit of that so they didn't want anybody to get stuck this morning. Now if it had been me on the other hand, I'd like to see them razor sharp and I'd like to see them handed out and where somebody grabbed them and had to go ouch and you reach down and you pinch your finger and a little bit of blood came out because I'm not out to stir your emotions this morning. It's not my intent to put you on a high and to have you shouting before you leave. But it is my intention this morning to communicate to you that anything that God has that is worth having, it's going to be beautiful. When you finally get to it, when you finally reach it, when it finally matures, once you hold it in your hand, it, it's going to be beautiful. It's going to be worth it. But you're going to have to reach through some thorns. You're going to have to go through some thorns in life. You're going to have to reach into some thorny situations if you're going to get the rose that God has for you. That's why most folks, when they first see something that God has for them, they'll go for it and they'll think, man, that's going to be great. That's going to be wonderful. All these promises, the Word of God promises all these things. I just, I want to be, be a minister and I want to minister the Word of God and we all ought to want to do that and everyone in here is a minister. But what we look at, what we focus on, is we look at the rose. We look at the rose itself. We look at the rosebud itself and we say, man, isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? Mmm, it smells so good. And then we go to try to pick the rose. We go to try to receive what God has for us and we stick a bare hand in and Every gardener knows and anybody that's ever raised roses understands that you never reach for a rose without gloves on. Why? Because as you reach for that rose, you're bound to get stuck. Tell your neighbor, you've been stuck, hadn't you? Come on now. 
Come on, you've been stuck. You, you, you've reached for something beautiful and, and you've got stuck in the process. I like what Abraham Lincoln said about the rose. He said, we can complain because rose bushes have thorns or rejoice because thorn bushes have roses. This message is for those of us this morning who are in the midst of what we know is great beauty. We know God's doing something in our life. We, we know it. We can't put it all together yet. Maybe some don't, don't have the full picture yet. But we all know that there's something. God's doing something beautiful in our lives. We may know that we know Jesus. We may know that we have eternal life. And you're supposed to know that you can have eternal life this morning. With God, it's not a question. It's a statement. You can know that you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You may know that you have the Holy Spirit. You may know some revelation that God's given you concerning the things of the kingdom. You may know some of the promises of God. We may even have some knowledge of our kingdom purpose and kingdom destiny. But it's all happening in the midst of thorns. It's all happening in the midst of thorns. We, we can see what God has for us. We see the right thing, but we're still getting stuck by thorns. We're reaching. We know we're reaching for the right thing. Some of you in here this morning, it's not just that you see it and are getting stuck, but some of you see it and you, you're going after it and you're still being stuck when you reach to receive it. Now the crazy thing is this, is God said you could have it. Whatever it is that you're moving for, whatever you're going for in the kingdom of God this morning, whatever promise God has given you, you need to understand God has given you that. But the uninitiated, the young in the Lord do not yet understand that when you go to reach for the promise, the devil will always make sure there's a thorn there to try to keep you from reaching for what God has for you. Because you see, in receiving things from the Lord, we, we talk about receiving things from the Lord. I don't receive something from the Lord by just sitting there and doing like this. Now, there are certain spiritual blessings I can get. There's impartations of the Spirit of God. But most everything that you and I do that, that, that God has promised us, you and I have to put forth some kind of faith effort to receive. And it's in the processing of that faith wall, that stepping out that says, I'm going to receive that, I want that, that we go for it. And the rose that we saw suddenly becomes this big thorn bush that looks like we're not going to be able to get to what God has for us. Chastity had to uh, do a last minute assignment. For those of you that don't know, Chastity is my, my oldest daughter. And she is... Uh, taking courses through Regent University right now to get her Master's of Divinity degree. She's going to be smarter than her daddy and preach more harder than her daddy when, when the time comes. And Chessie's very studious. She's very, she has to be. She, she's kind of like her dad. She's kind of ADD. So we work good with deadlines. And when we know what we got to do something, then we, we schedule things out. And we know this has to be done and this. And, and she does really well at it. I'm, I'm really proud of her. And yet yesterday she got up early in the morning. I said, what are you doing? She said, I've got a paper that's due at 12 o'clock. And she looked at me and she said, Daddy, I don't mean a little paper. I mean a big paper. And I looked at her and I said, Chas, that's not like you. Why are you having to, to push here at, at this close of time? I mean, you've got four hours to do a paper that was supposed to take you a week to do and you've got to you gotta have it presentable. I mean, college level, master level presentable in four hours. And she looked at me, and for the life of me, what she said just went right into my spirit. She said, Dad, I had everything ready. Everything was ready to, to do, and then life happened during my assignment. <laughs> in other words, I know what I'm going to do, and I know it's going to be good. But every time I try to reach to do it, some thorny situations came up this week that she had to deal with. And it caused her to have to push 
at the end to get it done. I'm convinced everyone who has any measure of revelation about the Lord or His kingdom has some type of thorn that they're going to have to work through. At times we must both live and minister with our thorn. You and I are going to have to keep moving. Matter of fact, this is true most of the time. Most of the time in our assignment from the Lord, we're going to have to keep pushing through those thorny times and situations and circumstances that come into our lives. Now, some folks will use their thorn as an excuse as to why we can't do what the Lord's told us to do. Our thorn may hurt so badly that it makes ministry to others seem impossible. I mean, come on, Lord, you wouldn't really want me to keep on reaching for this while I'm hurting so bad, while I'm being stuck so bad, while the enemy is on me so bad, while the family is on me so bad, while so many other things in my life are not working out. Lord, you couldn't want me to stay the course. You couldn't keep me wanting to serve you. You couldn't really want me to keep pushing ahead. You really... You see, if the enemy finds out he can stop you with the prick of a thorn then my friends, you can just expect that every time you step out to do something, no matter how excited you are in the beginning to do it, that the enemy's going to come at you with a thorny switch because he's found out he can stop you. On the other hand, our thorn may be visible. Others may see it. And we think because they see my thorn, they see my hurt, they see my weakness, they see whatever it is that I'm unworthy to fulfill the call that God's put on my life. The devil may use our thorn as an instrument to keep us feeling weak, depressed, and useless. The devil may even use it to cause us to hurt worse. See, I'm preaching down here where you are. It's quiet in here. The enemy may actually take that thorn in the midst of of you being the most obedient and stick it in a little bit farther and twist it just a little bit to make you pay or to stop you from fulfilling the call of the Lord upon your life. I'm I'm preaching to somebody in here this morning besides me. You see, you and I will always have to decide If possessing the rose is worth the pain of the thorns, it's always going to be a price to pay. Even the great apostle Paul had a thorn. If you want to look in 2 Corinthians 12, 7, I'm going to read it to you. We're going to spend a little bit of time here. Paul said, because of this surpassing greatness of the revelation, For this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me and to keep me from exalting myself. Now this is an incredibly interesting passage of Scripture here because Paul is acknowledging a weakness. He is acknowledging, and we'll see here in a moment, and what some schools of thought would would tell us is he's experiencing a prayer failure. Because he asked the Lord three times to remove this thorn and the Lord three times told him no. And some would tell us today that 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 was a lack of faith, uh, that Paul was struggling in his faith. And yet when I look at this context, what I see is a man with great faith. What I see is a man overcoming every obstacle. Even something that the Lord... And this is the part that, that... Sometimes you just have to take the Word of God for what the Word of God says. This is a messenger from Satan that God allowed. I've become real careful what I rebuke anymore. See, I I was brought up old school years ago where you were taught to to rebuke everything that came into your life that didn't give you the feel goods. Boy, hallelujah. If it made me feel bad in the name of Jesus, I don't receive that. I reject it. And yet the Word of God, the New Testament, plainly tells us 
that God's people will at times face difficulties. And they will at times face situations and circumstances that are going to be thorny in nature. That there's actually going to be circumstances that God will not deliver you from. But rather use you in the midst of. We aren't told what Paul's thorn was other than it was a messenger of Satan that in some way pained the flesh of Paul. Some have theorized that it was a constant attack of the Judaizers because everywhere Paul went, the Judaizers were following him up and trying to bring people back into Judaism rather than the freedom that they have in the Messiah. Others say that Paul had an eye condition, and I believe Paul had an eye condition. He actually said that, that he, he pretty much did in one place. He, anytime Paul wrote letters, Paul actually had someone else writing the letters for him, and then he would sign them. And he would The, the mark of Paul, of the, the epistle being written, that it was the Apostle Paul, he would say, look with what large print I have used to sign. Many say that it was because Paul was pretty much blind. And many theorize that it was the Damascus experience where God came in a brilliant light and knocked him off his donkey. And it, even though the scales fell from his eyes and he could see enough to see to live life, he still had such poor eyesight that he was dependent upon somebody else to have to write these powerful epistles that you and I have. Then there's what Paul gives us in Romans chapter 7. Religion doesn't like Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7 is where the Apostle Paul says, the things that I wish I do, the things that I wish that I did, I don't do, and the things that I didn't want to do, I do. Oh, wretched man that I am. Paul was, I, I love the Bible and I love the Apostle Paul because he was so honest. And he acknowledged that that. He had weaknesses in his flesh. There were things that he had to deal with and there were things that he knew that he should do, but he didn't do them. And they pained him. But the reality is this, is that the Scriptures really don't tell us. We really aren't told here what this thorn in the flesh was exactly. And I believe that God did it on purpose. So that all God's people down through the ages, down, down, right down to you and I, can look at Paul's thorn and we can apply it to our situation, to our hurt, to our setback, to our heartache, to that thing that just seems to always be there that just won't go away and we think in our fleshly man that if it doesn't go away, we can't go on and serve the Lord. Yet the truth of the matter is, God says you can serve me better with your thorn than without it. I'm going somewhere. Oh, we want to be delivered from our thorn bush, don't we? I could do what God wants me to do if I could just get free of this thorn bush. This this wouldn't be this wouldn't I could go on and do what God wants me to do if He'd just take this this bitterness, this hurt, this pain, this situation, this circumstance from me. And we pray, Lord, deliver me from this thorn bush. But deliverance doesn't come. Sometimes in the midst of our asking for deliverance, the thorns may even plunge deeper, hurt more. And our responsibilities may even increase for the moment. We pray, Lord, deliver me from the thorn bush. And we think God has not hurt us because He is yet to deliver us. Or it could be that he has heard us. And his answer was no. Wow. Second Corinthians 12, 8 goes on to say, this is Paul's response. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. Grace being gifting anointing, enabling, is sufficient. That word sufficient mean, actually means more than enough. It's sufficient. 
for you. If you've got your Bible open and, re- open and reading that, I want you to underline that word for you. My grace is sufficient for you. Look at your neighbor and tell him right now, he's sufficient in you. Sometimes the victory is not in the immediate deliverance. Sometimes the victory is in the grace to be sufficient for you in the moment. Paul goes on and he says, For power is perfected in weakness. Man. My power is perfected in your weakness. That means that God is there available to us and in us and is sufficient in us when we are feeling the least sufficient, not the most. And and, and I believe in a bold faith. And, And I believe in a bold profession of the Word. And I believe in walking tall and straight in the things of God. I do. I I believe that I do the best that I can in walking it myself. But I'm telling you something. I'm coming to understand that sometimes God works the most powerfully through us when we walk with a limp. And sometimes the most power that the Lord gives us is when our shield of faith seems like it's drooping a little bit and we can't hold our sword as high as we once did. Sometimes I've learned I have to keep my eye on the rose and my hand on the rose in spite of the pain of the thorns. How is perfected in weakness. Our acknowledgement of our inability and His ability. This next one's what blows me away. Most gladly, Paul says, most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Most gladly. How many, of, how many of you, and I include myself in this, are really glad when the thorn goes in deep and the blood starts running? How most gladly, Paul said, if Christ is stronger in me when I'm weak, then let the thorn go in deeper. Let the pain be greater because as the pain is greater, His power is greater to reach others for Christ. Therefore I will, therefore I am well content. I'm I'm getting there, I'm not there yet. Therefore I am well content with weakness with insults, with distress, with persecution, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Most of us, when experiencing some form of persecution for Christ's sake, because of our Western cultured mentality and we're always supposed to feel good and always supposed to be on top and everything's always supposed to be great. When when, when that first thorn sticks, we are more likely to go gripe and growl and complain or quit. Paul said, I've learned to be content in the midst of the thorn bush while reaching for the rose. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Paul prayed in faith until he clearly heard the Lord say, No. 
Three times. This is a mighty man of faith here. This is the Apostle Paul. Three times he said, God, take this thing away from me. Take this thorn out of my flesh. Rebuke the enemy for me. And three times the Lord said, no. Could it be the thing you're asking deliverance from is the very thing God wants to get glory through you in the midst of? Have you ever prayed that prayer, Lord, use me? Some piously, Lord, use me to thy greater glory. So that I can glory with you in glory. And some have honestly, on bended knee and with great sincerity, got down and said, Lord, use me for your glory. And instead of putting you on a pedestal, he threw you in the midst of a thorn bush. Oh, it's full of roses. There's promises to be received. There's people to be, to be one to the Lord. But this job really is a pain in the I'm about to get free. I'm going to scare y'all to death one of these days. Lord, that person just just grates on me, just, just pricks me, that situation. That child, that spouse, and yet that's the very person. You, you, you prayed. You prayed, God, use me for your glory. And the Lord, then the Lord puts you in a situation that is hopeless for you in your own strength to do anything with. And you'll be forced to do one of two things. Back out of the thorn bush and walk away. And you can do that. It's all free will. God's not going to force you to do that. The problem is you're going to walk away looking at all the roses that were supposed to be yours, but you were too soft. You were too weak, mighty woman of God, mighty man of God full of faith and valor, jump up and down and holler in church. Show everybody how great you are. Let God put you in a thorny situation. And you a wimp. <laughs> and you walk away looking at all the roses in that thorn bush that could have been yours. Or you can put your gloves on, put your long sleeve shirt on, put on the full armor of a God, knowing fully well that no matter how well you think you're covered, there's going to be a thorn in there somewhere that is going to get you somewhere in the process that's going to make you go, ouch, oh, that hurts. But I'm going to get you. I'm going to have that rose. I'm going to have that promise. I'm going to have the finished product that God has for me. You still with me? Paul prayed in faith until he clearly heard God say, not my strength. No, my strength is perfected in your thorn. In other words, I can do better things through you while you're thorn, with your thorn than I can do with you if you have no thorn at all. Psalms 34, 19. We know this one by heart. Every child of God knows this one. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us out of them all. Our problem is we want the deliverance before the affliction. God shows us something, gives us something, and we start to walk into it. And the older you get in the Lord, the smarter you get, or you should. And you get that great prophecy, or you get that great promise, or God stirs your spirit about that thing that He wants to raise up in, 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 uh, around you. And, and you, you start to walk into it, and then you recognize... This is going to hurt. 
that this is going to hurt. I don't see any way around it. You circle it. You look over. You look under. You look for the easiest way to get to that rosebud to cut it off. The problem is it's surrounded by thorns. Luke writes this in Acts 14.22. He says, Strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, saying, Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. That word tribulation, that word actually, when we think of tribulation, most folks think of, of beating and whipping and that kind of thing. That, that's really not what that word means. The Greek word there literally means to be pressed. To be stressed. Just a couple of questions and we'll wrap it up. Could it just be that other people need to see you hurting and bleeding while you continue to serve God? Could it just be that God really receives more glory as He works through bleeding vessels than whole ones who seem to have everything together in the flesh? Are you willing to reach through your own thorns to reach for the rose that God has concerning His will for your life? Could it, be, could, could it just be that God wants to use your own thorns to reveal His greater glory through you? Listen, I'll, I'll be honest with you. When I'm going through a struggle, it grates on me to see old smiling on TV just smiling and life's great and good and everything's wonderful. <laughs> Now, everybody needs a gift of encouragement. And I admire these men and women that have such a great gift of encouragement because it stirs me. But come on, you ain't smiling all the time. Your life ain't rosy. You, you're, you're just like me. You may be better at what you do than what I do. You may have another place in the kingdom than what I have. But when it comes down to flesh and blood... You and me, brother, you and me, sister, we, we, we come from the same stuff. And, and you're not smiling all the time when the cameras aren't on. Come on. Man, I am so thankful to see some mighty men of God start to get honest with the body of Christ today and really starting to share what they're going through. Man, my, my apostolic covering, he, he's sharing now, sharing now with, with his people and, and with the world what he goes on behind the scenes. Other great men of God that, that we watch on television, they're, they're standing up and they're saying, this is how it is when the lights aren't on. Could it be that somebody else is watching you to see how you deal with your thorny situation to see if your faith's really real? Now watch this. If the Lord would allow us to have the eyes of the Spirit this morning to look at one another. And suddenly, we were just as we were in His sight. I promise you that most folks in here are bleeding somewhere. Life. I'm not talking about physical blood now, but most everyone in here is bleeding in some way. You've someone said something to you ugly. Someone's treating you less than. You've been rejected. You've not been honored or respected as you should have as a child of God. You have done everything you know to do in a situation or a circumstance that you're in and it just seems like you're not getting anywhere. And if the veil would be dropped in here this morning, most every one of us in here are bleeding somewhere because of something. 
And the devil wants you to concentrate on the pain and the hurt and the blood that's dripping rather than on what God is accomplishing through you in the midst of your hardship. Because what you are going through, listen to me, child of God, it's never just about you. You have got to get a kingdom understanding of this. We have got to get out of our own little bubble of a world that it's all about me, poor little me. It is not. It is all about the kingdom. Once you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you signed up with a new army. You entered into a new kingdom. You entered into a new way of life. And you decided, here I am. I will be a witness for Jesus Christ. And the world and other Christians are watching you and I. And the situations that we find ourselves in many times are the Lord's path to receiving more glory through us as He strengthens us and uses us in spite of, not because of. Come on, let's get honest. When does, when does God get the most glory? When, when we're succeeding in everything that we're doing, when we're large and charged and strong and in power and everybody's looking at us and patting us on the back and saying, man, you're doing a good job, that's great. And then they're walking away going, I sure wish I could do that. I could never do that. Or when you're in the midst of something that is so hard that everybody else is looking at you and they're going, I don't know how that person is making it. And then they come and they ask you, how are you doing that? How are you making it through that? I don't understand how you are still standing. I don't see how you are still making it. I don't. If, if that was me, I would be rolled over. I do not understand why you are still standing. Would you tell me why you can still smile sometimes in the midst of what you're going through? That is your open door to allow the Lord to be strong through you and you can say because the Lord is my shield and my strength he has a promise for me he is not a God that he should lie it doesn't matter how thorny the bush is that I have to crawl through to get to my rose. I'm just going to wait on through it and get what belongs to me. Many times when you hear ministers preach out of the Song of Solomon, they actually say that Jesus is the rose of Sharon. But I've already showed you that in context, there's no way Jesus can be the rose of Sharon. The rose of Sharon is you and I. It's the bridegroom who comes into the low place and reaches through to get his beautiful rose. Do you understand that when the Lord looked at you, he saw a rose in the midst of thorn? You see, the truth of the matter is Most everybody's in a mess before they come to Jesus. Come on. Most everybody's hurt, rejected, mad, angry. Feel misused and abused. Mad at people, mad at the devil, and mad at God. All at the same time, we're just a mess. We're a thorny mess. Someone's got to be willing to get through your thorns to get to the rose that God sees in you. You see, Jesus came as the bridegroom to get his bride. And in doing so, he came and took on human form. Sinless, yes. But he left heaven to walk in flesh and blood like you and I. That that blows me away. That blows me away as much as the cross. When you understand that throughout all eternity past, he was royalty, and then of his own own volition, of his own choosing, because of his great love for you and I, he chose to come and live in one of these in a fallen world and have to put up with all the things of the body that you and I have to put up with without sin, but still 
going through the same stuff. All the emotions, all the physical things, all the things of maturing and growing in the natural world. He did it. And then, he got a big successful ministry. Cranking and going. Everybody hailed him as the king on Palm Sunday. We're coming up on Palm Sunday in a month or so. Everybody hailed him as the king. But my friend, the will of the Father was not for him to be the king. For him, the will of the Father was to go pluck the rose. The rose of Sharon. And you can't pluck the rose without the thorns. So they bound him hand and foot and they took a cat of nine tails, a thorny whip, and they ripped his flesh off his body. And then they took a thorny crown, not little thorns like on rose bushes, but thorns that were four to six inches long and they wove a crown out of it and they, after they had beaten him and flogged him and ridiculed him and spit on him, they pushed that crown of thorns down on top of his head and, and the thorns came through the skin in his skull. They would go in one place and they would come out the other. Then they nailed his hands and feet to an old wood beam. This is the Son of God we're talking about. But to get to the rose of Sharon, he had to go through the thorns. He had to suffer to redeem us. He had to shed His blood so that your sin and my sin could be forgiven. And then He had to go into a cold grave for the better part two and a half to three days to be resurrected. And when He came out, He came out with the keys to death, hell, and the grave. And because he went through the thorns for you and I, you and I now have eternal life. Abraham Lincoln had it right. You can choose to fuss because roses have thorns. Or you can choose to thank God that thorn bushes have roses. I don't know about you, but I have to choose daily. I have to choose daily to decide that the thorn, whatever it is that I have to go through, is worth it for somebody else to experience Christ. Because you see, it's not about us. It's about others. And when you take that, listen, if, if, you let it to be, if you let it all be about you, if it's all about you, oh, poor me. Oh, poor me. And I don't mean this ugly because, I mean, some preachers make me mad the way they preach this. I mean, when you are down and out and hurting and you can't hardly get back up off the ground to move, and then some preacher comes and just kind of rubs your face down in it because you don't have enough faith or God hadn't delivered you yet or you're still in your situation. I just, I just, I've learned to just change the channel. I don't receive condemnation. But I, I'm, I'm talking about you and I have got to get some spiritual tenacity about us. For we understand it ain't about me. Pardon my ain't Southwest Virginia. It, it's, it's not about me. When I come to understand that that others are watching. And that the Lord wants to use you and I for His glory. You have to decide. You have to decide. Are the thorns worth the rose? 
And I'm here to tell you this morning, they are. They are. That wayward husband, that wayward wife, that wayward child, those lost loved ones, those lost friends, that person that's just prickly as a pine needle every time you get around them. Been around them? You know what I'm talking about? Folks, that just, just get around them and it's prickly. It just don't touch me. Don't say anything to me. Don't you dare mention the name of Jesus to me about anything like that. You have got to decide that it's worth the pain. To possess the rose. I want everybody to pick your rose up. I'm telling you why. I don't know about yours, but mine is an absolutely beautiful rose. It's just, it's just, I told her I wanted to get, get nice roses, get good roses. So I just want you to look at it. I want you to see how beautiful it is. I want you to smell it. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. And now look up here. I want you to understand this. This is how God views you. You are the rose of Sharon. And you are beautiful. You are beautiful just like you are. He waited. Listen, he waded through all the thorn bushes. He went through all the pain. He did it all for you so that you could come out of it smelling like a rose. And if you won't falter, if you'll hang on just a little bit longer, and your deliverance might be just a praise away, God may be waiting on you to quit complaining about the thorns and start praising Him for the rose. And your deliverance will come. Well, we hope you enjoyed that. I got a text from a friend of mine while we played that. I said, wow. He said, why does it sound like this is the first time I've heard this message? It's amazing how God's Word never, ever gets old. Well, we hope you like that. A uh, couple announcements. We've got uh, next Saturday, men, we have a men's breakfast at the Golden Corral uh, in front of Sam's Club. We'll be meeting there at 8 o'clock. Uh, I think uh, 8.50 is the, the charge. Uh, for any other details, uh, feel free to get in touch with uh, JT or Adam McDaniel, and they'll be happy to give you any information that you need. Uh, also, the December 22nd, which is the Sunday before Christmas, we'll be having our children's program and Christmas brunch. Um, we're still looking and believing for 200 people. Uh, just uh, get out there and invite your friends and family and uh, get them in there to hear some good word and have some good fellowship and enjoy our children put on a, a really neat program. I got to see uh, the outline of that, and I think you're going to enjoy that. <clears throat> Uh, for our home members and those who may be looking to find a way to sow into the ministry at River Church, um, our online giving is up and available. Um, just simply go to www.riverchurchroanoke.com. In the upper right-hand corner, you'll see a link that says Give. Uh, you just simply click that, and it will bring you to another page. Uh, in fact, it's a PayPal page, but you do not need a PayPal to be able to sow into this ministry. Um, but that's pretty simple. It's pretty self-explanatory on, on that form. Well, God bless you. Have a good day. Stay safe out there today, and we'll see you next Sunday.